Welcome to the, uh, the speaker series. Um, today, it's my privilege to uh, introduce uh, Gus Beth, who I've known for about over a decade now. I am, for those of you who don't know, my name is Aaron Manser. I am a, a professor here at the economics department. And uh, most of my research is on energy economics. And um, about three years ago, I came to campus here. Before that, I was working at Yale, including at, the, at a joint appointment between the business school and the environment school. And my first uh, dean ever was this man here. So um, I'll, I'll go through a lot of things that uh, Gus has done, but I, I uh, know him best as, as Dean Speth. Um, so Gus uh, was a, a student at Yale. Um, as well, and um, earned his, his bachelor's degree there and his law degree. And um, early on was um, very active in, um, in the uh, Carter administration, working for the Council of Environmental Quality, and um, also uh, found, was one of the co-founders of Natural Resource Defense Council, and uh, he found, was the founder of the World Resource Institute and um, from there, went on to, to work at the UN, and, uh, and then finally to um, come to, to Yale, and uh, among other things, uh, invited me to, to be on his faculty. So it's uh, great to see him again, um, now that we're both living up in the Upper Valley. And, uh, and in addition to uh, being a dean and all that involves, about a decade ago, Gus uh, started to write a number of books on the topic that we'll be hearing about today. And um, kind of the, we're seeing the third book in a, a trilogy uh, he's been working on, on these questions about uh, environmental policy and, and uh, the economy and, and how well these two really work together. And something that I have a lot of interest in myself. So it's great to, to have him here. Uh, one final note, and uh, just to let everyone know, there will be a, a book signing um, right afterwards. So if, if you want to stick around for that afterwards, there's books for sale out in the hall. Um, so without further ado, please help join me in welcoming Gus Beth. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you all. Uh, I guess I think we're going to uh, beat the bad weather uh, out of here. Uh, so take heart. Uh, we're looking forward to this snow, right? This is supposed to be white up here this time of year. Um, thank you, Aaron. Uh, that was a real catch when we got Aaron to come to Yale. And uh, I don't know how uh, those folks let him slip away, uh, but you're lucky to have him up here, and it's good to see so many friends in the audience. It's good to be at Dartmouth, what a, what a great place. Um, uh, when we decided to move up here, uh, we drew a big circle around uh, Dartmouth and, uh, and headed in to find a place in that circle. That was before I had a job at the Vermont Law School, but we knew we wanted to be in this area. Um, and um, so, uh, I began uh, writing uh, this book. Uh, I've been trained to hold it up, uh, America of the Possible. Uh, but I started really thinking a lot about my grandchildren. There are six of them now. And uh, what kind of world were we building for the young people uh, of today? What was America going to be like if we kept doing more of the same? And, uh, and that means growing a lot of things like the size of the environmental community. Uh, the NRDC that Aaron mentioned is a $100 million a year group now. Uh, the and lots of NGOs have grown in strength and number. And, uh, you know, but are we getting ourselves put on the right track? Uh, so one of the things I did was to take uh, Lincoln's advice and try to look at uh, where we are and whither we are tending. Uh, he said, uh, as a basis of knowing what we where we want to go and, and how to get there. Uh, and so I did. I looked at 30 uh, different uh, indicators of uh, national well-being and international citizenship. And I compared our situation with that of, uh, of, of 30, uh, 20 countries. 
uh, the, the advanced uh, democracies, uh, our peer countries, uh, Europe and Japan and Canada and Australia and New Zealand and on. And, uh, and I knew we were going to fare pretty poorly because I had been reading the newspapers, uh, but uh, I didn't know we were going to come out on the, on the bottom, literally on the bottom. Uh, the highest poverty rate, the greatest inequality of incomes, surprisingly the least social mobility, uh, the highest percentage of expenditures on health care, by far, as a proportion of GDP. And what do we get for all of that? Well, the highest infant mortality, the highest prevalence of mental health problems, the highest obesity rate, uh, the highest percentage of people going without health care due to cost, and the highest consumption of antidepressants, and to top it all off, the shortest life expectancy. <laughs> all for this huge proportion of GDP. Uh, we had the third lowest scores in math performance uh, and middling performance in science and reading on these international tests, the highest homicide rate, by far the most guns, the largest proportion of the population in uh, prison, uh, and indeed the largest prison population on the planet. Um, the second highest carbon dioxide emissions per capita, we were nipped out there by uh, Australia, as I recall. The highest the water consumption per capita, the lowest score on the environmental performance index that uh, Yale and Columbia uh, maintain. Uh, for the World Economic Forum, uh, the second largest uh, ecological footprint per capita. Uh, we're uh, at the bottom of the, these countries in international assistance for humanitarian and, uh, um, and development. Uh, we uh, have signed the, by far, uh, the fewest international conventions and treaties, whether you're talking about landmines or criminal court or rights of women or the rights of the child or any of the environmental agreements, for the most part, uh, we've not ratified them. Um, have the highest military spending, um, both in total and as a percentage of GDP, and the largest international arms sales. Um, the, um, when you have encompassing, and that just is the problems that you can sort of identify on international comparisons. I didn't mention our political shortfalls. Uh, so, basically, when you have these encompassing problems across this whole spectrum of economic, social, political, and environmental issues, uh, I think it's a fair conclusion that you have to come to uh, that it's not due to small reasons, that it's the system, stupid. Uh, you know, we live and work in a system of political economy that's programmed, uh, that's wired uh, to deliver these results. Um, it gives good results on some things, but, um, and I think it's a fair statement that it, uh, you know, it prioritizes uh, the generation of profits, the uh, GDP growth, um, projection of international power, uh, but it doesn't prioritize, the way it's wired now, people and place and planet, which is what the economy ought to be geared to do and prioritized uh, to do. So my conclusion, the first of the four conclusions I want to relate to you uh, is that we've got to focus on system change and changing this system of political economy. We've got to drive transformative change uh, till we get to a new operating uh, system that really does give routinely uh, good results for people in place and uh, planet. Um, Uh, I think that, you know, I'll talk in a, a moment about what I see as the critical dimensions of the current system and the directions that we need uh, to change them. But I think it, you know, in a way it gets back to two overarching uh, problems. Uh, that one is the, uh, uh, that we really uh, have unleashed a very ruthless and rapacious, rapacious brand of capitalism. Uh, not the textbook capitalism, uh, not some idealized capitalism, but the one we actually have. And uh, secondly, uh, you know, there's a set of negative forces that stem from the wake of the Cold War and the evolution of our national security state. 
So I want to discuss the key elements uh, that, that stem from these two overarching factors uh, uh, and the needed directions of change in a minute, but the important point in this first part is just to stress that we need, as progressives, uh, those of us who've been working on incremental reforms need to be as at least driven uh, to promote uh, deep systematic system change uh, reforms. Um, we live and work in a system of political economy that's failing it, and if we want to deliver good, good results for a future generation, we've got to change the system. Uh, so that leads me really to the second point, uh, and that is the imperative of having a compelling vision of where we want to go. This was something, when I did the book, I didn't find a lot of material written on, sort of an envi envisioning the U.S. Uh, in the world uh, in, say, 2050. Uh, so, as they say, fools rush in, and I have a, a chapter in the book that does uh, describe what I see as a, an attractive future for the country, uh, but, um, but one that's still plausible. I mean, it is plausible, and yet it's still uh, attractive. Uh, not every future is now open to us. Uh, a future without any climate change is not uh, open to us any longer, uh, but um, but it's a tricky business of describe, trying to describe uh, the world of 2050. But I tried, uh, and there are probably many futures that are attractive. In, in addition to the ones that, that I, the elements that I sketch out. But basically, in this future, we will have climbed out of the basement of the OECD, where, as I just described, we are. We will have dealt with those issues and joined the uh, front ranks of the world's nations. Uh, we would have had the intelligence to head off calamities like climate change, things that could uh, absorb time and energy and money and deflect us from doing the things that we, we ought to be doing. There will have been a deep change in values away from the materialism, uh, contempocentrism, anthropocentrism of, uh, of our current uh, way of life. And uh, we will have opted for uh, what we might call uh, globalization. Uh, a blend of, uh, of the best of, of uh, globalization uh, with a, a dramatic refocusing of life at the community uh, level. Um, so that's the second thing that we need, is a, to, to forge together a joint uh, vision of, of the future that we would like to see. Um, now, a change happens just not because people have a positive vision of, of something they are striving for together, but people, you know, we have to see the means to get there, at least enough of the means to get there to start. And the bulk of the book, uh, you know, does that. Uh, so, and this third imperative is, is that we, we have to know enough to move confidently ahead. And I think we do. Uh, I was uh, impressed by what other people had discovered about the ways uh, to move ahead, and, and my book is an attempt to present what I found uh, when I looked at a series of transformations that struck me as essential uh, to make this overall transformation. Um, these are transformations that are aimed at undermining the key motivational structures of the current system uh, and replacing these old structures uh, with new arrangements that uh, are needed for a sustaining economy, a restorative economy, and a successful democracy. Um, so what are these transformations that I talk about and try to describe how we might make them uh, in the book? Uh, first, in, in the market. Um, from um, the current market uh, uh, to uh, powerful market governance in the public interest. Uh, from dishonest prices to, to honest ones. Uh, from widespread uh, commodification to protection of the commons. In the corporation, uh, from shareholder primacy to stakeholder primacy. From predominantly one ownership model to, do, to new business models involving a series of alternative forms of ownership and to ultimately to the democratization of, uh, of capital. Economic democracy at many levels. In money and finance, uh, from a focus on Wall Street to rebuilding the focus of banking and uh, support uh, on Main Street. 
for money created uh, through bank debt, which is the way most of it comes about, to money created as Lincoln wanted uh, by government. Uh, in economic growth, uh, from our growth fetish to a post-growth uh, society, uh, from mere GDP growth to growth in the things that really matter, uh, human welfare, and growth in democratically determined priorities. Um, I want to pause on the growth issue because it is so central, I think. Uh, you know, since 1980, the size of the U.S. economy has gone up maybe 130 percent in real terms. We had tremendous growth, right? We grew. Uh, and what did we get? Well, poverty mounted to an all-time high uh, numbers, if not percentage. Uh, Inequality returned to 19A, the 1920s levels. Uh, 42,000 manufacturing plants left, shuttered, or left our borders. Um, real wages flatlined, the wage rate, during that period. Uh, life satisfaction flatlined during that period, the whole time. Uh, depressions went up. Depression, psychological depression, went up. Uh, trust went down. Uh, you know, it's all in the context of, uh, of, of, of an era in which uh, the, we were growing at maybe 3% a year for most of that time. Um, so the problem is that you know, growth doesn't work. Doesn't, GDP growth is what I'm talking about. It doesn't deliver in and of itself. Uh, it deflects our attention from trying to grow the things that we really do need to grow, like good jobs and modern infrastructure and green technologies. Uh, it empowers those that we have to turn to, to to grow. The U.S. government or any government doesn't own much of the U.S. economy, so we have to empower the corporations to grow. and. You, I, there are a long list of policies that we should be implementing to improve quality of life, to improve the well-being of people, to improve the environment, and the principal argument that's always raised against them is that it will uh, slow growth. And uh, so it puts, makes politically more difficult a host of things that we uh, need to, to do to improve the quality of life in our country, and I could give you that list. Uh, um, so this growth fetish is a source of a big problem for us, I think, and it's not delivering. You know, the economy is already back bigger than it, GDP terms, bigger than it was before the recession in 2008. And we have 8% uh, unemployment and uh, probably an equal number of people underemployed, part-time employed, or dropped out. Um, another transition is a transition in social conditions. Uh, from uh, this vast economic insecurity we have to, to fundamental fairness and economic security for our people, um, from joblessness to guaranteed job for all who want to work. Uh, in indicators uh, from this tyranny of this uh, misguided conception of uh, GDP, uh, which merely includes everything all the transactions in, this, in the economy and doesn't tell us anything about how well we're really doing. Um, that from Bobby Kennedy in his last speech in 1968, very cogent statement on the problems of GDP. That's a grossly distorted picture for those of you who don't know. Um, but there are new indicators that we uh, should be developing and can develop. In consumerism, a transition from our affluenza to enough, enough already. Uh, we've got enough. Uh, and uh, in our communities, from uh, the throwaway communities uh, and, uh, throw and, and runaway enterprises uh, to vital local economies and, and rootedness, in the shift in cultural values that I mentioned earlier, from, from getting to, to giving, from richer to better, from separate to connected, uh, from apart from nature to part of nature, from near term uh, to long. Remember what uh, 
Moynihan, Senator Moynihan said the central conservative truth is indeed that uh, values really do matter and determine the fate of societies. But the central liberal truth uh, is that society can change its values and raise its, raise its consciousness and chart a new course uh, for itself. Um, and in foreign policy and the military, which I'll return to in a few minutes, uh, from this uh, exceptionalism uh, to America as normal nation, uh, from militarization to real uh, security. The great thing about looking at the problem in this way uh, is that you can identify in each of these areas of transformation lots of people, lots of groups, and lots of good ideas for making uh, the transformation. And one of the new groups that we've created is something called the New Economics Institute, uh, which is now headquartered in Boston. Uh, and we're off and running with a new president. And uh, we're going to transform that, I think, into something called the New Economy Coalition, which will be a space so that groups working on all of these dozen issues that I just went through with you uh, can come together and see each other and magnify their power and their influence. Um, so the, the fourth and final imperative that I want to speak about uh, briefly is, is the imperative of, uh, of addressing our, 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 our failing democracy. We are in a context now of this creeping corporatocracy and plutocracy, um, and uh, we need to, as a matter of highest priority, pursue an agenda of, of pro-democracy political reforms uh, and, and start doing it uh, quickly. Uh, things like securing the vote and, and the voter, uh, undermining the power of, of big money and the ascendancy of money over people in our politics, uh, you know, shifting power from corporations to people uh, in the policymaking process. Remember, the corporations spend maybe 10 times as much on lobbying and influence peddling as they do on elections. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we're a uh, afflicted by, these, uh, by this ascendancy of corporate power and money power in our politics. And there's a lot that we can do. The book uh, has an agenda of a dozen or so uh, com you know, really important political changes that we need to make uh, to reduce the power of money, to secure the vote, to break the two-party duopoly, uh, to have independently determined congressional districts and gradually work our way out of this uh, terrible polarization, which is, as political scientists tell us, is, uh, hasn't been matched since uh, Reconstruction. Um, so just to stress two points about our, our, our politics, I don't think we'll ever get far on political reform or much of anything else as long as the progressives are, are so siloed and so isolated in their separate agendas and communities. Uh, some students of mine wrote a wonderful paper in which they said progressives have a uh, strategic deficit disorder. Uh, unlike the forces of, of, on the conservative side, uh, we're all fractured and don't have a, a common uh, agenda, a common sense of identity, uh, a common way of, of messaging and, and working together uh, on things, uh, a common backbone institutions. Uh, and so we need to bring the progressives uh, together with this, for the, with this common infrastructure and effort if we're going to make real progress. We're good at isolated, coming together for isolated campaigns, but we don't have the Tuesday meeting that Grover Norquist uh, had every week uh, for all the conservative groups in Washington. Uh, it may still be going on. Uh, and secondly, uh, I think it's pretty clear that achieving meaningful change is going to require a rebirth of, of direct action, of marches, of protest, of citizen demand. Uh, you know, this, these, are, these are the ways we can dramatize issues, uh, show the depth of concern that we have, uh, build sympathetic attention, and uh, put issues on the agenda. And so, you know, I got myself arrested down in Washington. Uh, Spent three days in the central cell block of the D.C. jail on the tar sands pipeline protest. And um, I, I bet there are buses coming down from this area to Washington on the 17th of this month where there will be tens of thousands of uh, climate protesters uh, gathering 
on the mall. Um, I want to um, uh, talk about, uh, you know, the theory of change a bit. Uh, and the one that's reflected in the book, and there may be better ones, uh, uh, you know, begins with the idea that three things have to, people have to come to three conclusions. And one is that we, we need to prioritize the system change that I discussed uh, at the outset, that the, problem, the problems that we have are, are systemic. And the second is that, uh, uh, you know, we not only need to see the problems as systemic, but we need to come together to seek to change the system. And uh, the third conclusion is that we really know a lot about how to start the process uh, of changing. And um, so we don't know all the details of how the alternative that we, of the better world that we could build will look, but we do know enough to start building it with confidence. Um, so these aren't conventional wisdom today, but I think more and more people are coming to these conclusions and they give, give us the background to how things might actually, the dynamics of change might actually uh, occur. Uh, so consider whether you think these, uh, these things are, are plausible, uh, whether you see signs uh, of them actually uh, happening. Uh, at first, as conditions across the country continue to decline, or at best, uh, fester as they are, uh, ever larger numbers of Americans lose faith uh, in the current system and in its ability to deliver on the values that it proclaims. And the system leads, loses support. And ultimately, there's a crisis of legitimacy, much as there was in the Great Depression. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we will experience a, a tra traditional crises, if you will, uh, in the economy, in the environment. And uh, in response, uh, progressives uh, finally do begin to coalesce, to find their voice and their strength and to pioneer the development of a of an even more powerful set of ideas and policy proposals confirming that the path to a better world does indeed exist. Demonstrations and protests multiply, and a popular movement for transformative change is born, allied with a popular movement, or perhaps broader in its base, for pro-democracy reform. And at the local level, uh, people and groups plant the seeds of change through a host of innovative uh, arrangements. Uh, with, with, which is the best thing going on in America today, in my judgment. All the transition towns, all the community sustainability and revitalization efforts, the new business forms, the public-private hybrids, the profit-not-for-profit hybrids, the co-op movement, the local banking movement, the public banking movement, on and on and on. It's really happening. And this, provide, this coming into the present of the future that we want to build is, is the most exciting uh, thing of all. And then sensing uh, the, the direction in which things are moving, our political leaders actually rise to the occasion, uh, support the growing movement for change, and very importantly frame a compelling story or, or narrative that makes sense of it all and provides a positive vision of a better country. And the movement broadens and becomes a major uh, national force. Well, we don't know how all these things will come together uh, or what sequence they might emerge or how they'll interact, uh, but we do know we'll, we'll be met with fierce opposition uh, to anything big enough to make a, a real difference. And that means that the likelihood of success will depend mightily on the movement that we have been able to build and the strength of, uh, of our grassroots efforts uh, to promote these things and hopefully by the time these things really begin to work together, uh, we will have built a much stronger uh, democracy uh, in our country. Um, now, I know that a lot of people here uh, at, at Dartmouth generally and, and in this room are particularly interested in international affairs, so let me talk a little bit about, uh, about that and the transformative uh, change that's needed uh, in, in that area. The general uh, point of view that I take in the book is that our international posture reflects a radical imbalance, uh, a hugely disproportionate focus on the military and on economic issues internationally, and a tragic neglect of many of the most serious challenges that we face internationally. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what has been called the American empire. 
uh, by many people who uh, love it and many people who don't. Uh, this uh, defense spending today is higher than at any point in the Cold War. Uh, we spend nearly as much on military power as the rest of the world combined, 43% of the world total, I think more than the next 15 countries. Uh, if you add the homeland security and intelligence spending, we're spending over a trillion dollars a year on security. Uh, you know, that's uh, um, two-thirds of all discretionary spending. Someone said, I think it was Ezra Klein at the Washington Post said, you should, we should think about our government as, a, as an insurance company with an army. Because uh, if you add up all the social security spending and, um, uh, and the uh, military spending, you've pretty much uh, exhausted it. Uh, it's a fourth of all federal spending going to security. In 2010, the Pentagon issued this uh, base structure report, there may have been some sense uh, that, uh, reporting that we had 662 military sites around the world uh, in 38 countries. Um, but they've been in that it, they leave out several of the countries where we're most deployed. And if you add them all up, as uh, some have tried to do, you conclude that there are a thousand military sites, roughly, that we maintain around the world. Nobody has ever garrisoned the world like the United States does now. And a lot of these are small, pods, they call them, and some of them are quite gigantic. Um, and um, there's more. Um, we, as I mentioned, we lead in the international arms trail, the trade, so 70% of the total. Um, we have, um, it was estimated in 2010 that we have 13,000 special operations troops deployed around the world in 75 countries, carrying out covert and clandestine operations. 40% of the world's countries were on the ground. Um, of course, the military industrial complex is as uh, powerful and as fearsome as it uh, ever has been. The poster boy, of course, is Lockheed Martin. Um, and you get some sense of why they're so powerful uh, uh, and getting uh, 36 billion uh, uh, in government spending a few years ago. They have facilities in 46 states uh, and de deliberately spread around to uh, maximize their political uh, uh, support. And then you may remember the 2010 uh, reports by the Washington Post on the uh, uh, the, the alarming size of our homeland uh, security uh, deployment. Uh, some 1,300 government organizations and 1,900 private companies at work on programs related to counterterrorism, homeland security, and intelligence spread around in some 10,000 locations in the United States. Uh, so whatever it has gained us, and I would not be one to say it's gained us nothing, This. The national security state has certainly created a world of trouble uh, for us and, and for others as well. A phenomenal drain on the federal budget, a major assault on privacy and, and civil liberties, a serious distortion of our national politics through this military industrial uh, complex, but the unfortunate consequences don't uh, stop there. One of the sorrows of empire stressed by Chalmers Johnson and Andrew Basevich and others, is the rise of militarism, uh, which they associate with the rise of a professional military class, the adoption of policies in which military preparedness becomes the highest priority of the state, we're certainly there, uh, and the tendency to see and to seek uh, military action as a solution to problems which can be dealt with otherwise. And of course, one consequence of militarism is that one does end up in wars, and we're tempted again. Uh, and it, you know, we think of uh, some of the issues associated with terrorism uh, as, and uh, issues associated with nuclear proliferation is perhaps getting us into wars, but I was looking uh, not long ago at, at three books that I have with had, which have these titles, Resource Wars, Water Wars, Climate Wars. Um, and then there's the threat to our uh, democracy. Uh, 
As Talmud Johnson put it, the combination of huge standing armies, almost continuous wars, and the ever-growing economic dependence uh, on the military-industrial complex has been destroying our Republican structure of governing in favor of an imperial presidency. We are on the brink of losing our democracy, he wrote, for the sake of keeping our empire. And of course we see in this current debate about the drones and the president's uh, asserted powers uh, to use them, uh, including against U.S. citizens, uh, uh, more of this uh, imperial uh, presidency. And then the final, and I think in a way, uh, uh, you know, most personal uh, sorrow of empire uh, is the draining psychological burden uh, that, uh, that it has on U.S. citizens. Uh, you know, as these events have unfolded in, in recent years, we, you know, experience uh, sadness, uh, depression, uh, denial, uh, uh, even a hardening of the spirit because we see our, our military and the CIA and our contractors engaged in torture, large killings of innocent civilians, uh, murders, the taking of body parts as souvenirs, renditions, drone assassinations, military detention without trial, collaboration with unsavory regimes, and more. And then, outside of this Pentagon of plenitude, the, the world of wounds is, is festering without much help and sometimes with harm uh, from the United States. We'd probably have a World Environment Organization now if it weren't for the United States. The Europeans have pushed it uh, twice. Uh, you know, we've badly neglected uh, our international responsibilities for climate protection and other environmental needs, badly underperformed in development and humanitarian assistance, underinvested in major challenges like uh, global population and transnational organized crime and our failed and fragile states, which uh, Secretary Gates once said was the principal security problem facing the world, uh, water management and food supply, uh, pandemic disease, clean energy, all areas we could be doing so, so uh, much uh, more uh, in. So, you know, we need to, for Congress to, and we need to push Congress to get serious about asserting the War Powers Act, uh, about uh, making this whole business uh, of security more uh, transparent and uh, checking the imperial presidency. Um, so, in the end, I think, uh, you know, it all comes down to, uh, to we the people. Um, do we still have it in us uh, to use our freedom and our democracy in, in a powerful way uh, to create something fine, uh, a reborn America for our children? I think we can realize a new American dream if enough of us join together and fight for it. Um, in this new dream, we can envision America where the pursuit of happiness is sought not in more getting and spending, uh, but in the growth of human solidarity and real democracy, devotion to the public good, where the average American is empowered to achieve his or her potential, where the benefits of economic activity are widely and equitably shared, where the environment is sustained for current and future uh, generations, where internationally we've assumed the role of good citizen and normal nation, and where the virtues of simple living and community self-reliance and good fellowship and respect for nature are predominant. Well, these are American traditions. They've not always prevailed, and they in many ways don't prevail today, but they are not dead. Uh, they await us, and indeed the country, I think, is being awakened today to uh, new ways of living and working and caring and sharing, and these new ideas beckon us to a new American dream, one that's actually rebuilt of, out of the best of, uh, of the American tradition, the best of who we were and are and can be. So thank you for listening. Um, I'm happy to take questions, comments. Uh, why did I think Roger Masters was going to put his hand up first? A teacher who has a student who's been very successful can always be very thankful for the fact that he's done as well as he has. And uh, 
overcame all of the terrible difficulties of having had to study once with me. It was a, one of the best courses I had at Yale, Roger. Well, but I, I, I do think, Gus, though, that you have left something really crucial out of the story. It's the mass media. And that's... And I'll give you an example. Mass oh, the, the media. mass media. Oh, yes, th those folks. And yeah. one reason for that is the mass media do not cover two things. First, they don't cover science at all. Secondly, they don't even give you details so that you don't know that the statistics that Gus cited from the OECD indicate that the average health care cost in the United States per year is, uh, in 2007 was $7,209 or something like that, 7, 000, over $7,200. The average of those 30 countries was 2,900. Two, almost two and a half times more. The details, you don't know them. And an example of what Gus himself did, tar sands. In my view, that whole thing is a waste of time because every automobile company in the world is shifting to hydrogen. Used uh, with a technology invented at MIT using solar energy to split water, H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen. You use the hydrogen as the fuel for a motor. It comes out the tailpipe and forms water with no CO2 at all. Great possibilities for job open. Great possibilities for ending CO2, which is going to fry the planet. And nobody, I can't get the press to write, print my stuff. They won't print it. I think you're right about the media uh, being a big part of the problem. Um, and um, I, I got so fed up with um, Brian Williams uh, reporting on um, weather disasters for years. And, and uh, then they, they would ask, they, would, they own the Weather Channel now, I think, too, don't they? Uh, uh, NBC. Uh, and they would, so he would call in some guy from the Weather Channel and ask him, well, why was, why was this strange event happening? And he would say, well, the jet, jet stream moved further south or something to that effect. But they never mention the fact that, uh, you know, behind a, a lot of these problems is the exacerbation due to climate changes. And uh, Jim Hansen and others have now documented that with such rigor. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there, there are real problems. Uh, we have, a, on the science side, I, I would characterize it this way. We have a, a, a public which is not well informed at a time on science issues. Uh, you know, half the people don't know that the Earth makes it around the sun in a year, <laughs> literally, uh, or that electrons are smaller than atoms. Uh, and uh, so you sort of start with that. Uh, and uh, the fact that the scientific content of public policy issues is going up across a huge you know, front of issues. Uh, and, uh, and then you add in um, uh, a, a good bit of, uh, of fear and resistance from people who uh, don't like the way what they're hearing from these pointy-headed intellectuals and the scientists, often in conflict with their religious convictions, over half say that they, well, I think it's well over half say that they would reject uh, a proven scientific conclusion if it conflicted with their religious beliefs. And, um, and then you add into that combustible mixture the, this very uh, intentional sowing of doubt. A uh, wonderful book by uh, Naomi Oreskes, uh, Merchants of Doubt. And she traces it from the tobacco, where it began, uh, owned up to uh, ozone hole and acid rain and secondhand smoke and then the climate. And she actually traces the same scientists showing up in each of those debates the whole time. Um, uh, you know, and these people are influential. Uh, Sites and uh, uh, others have been very influential. Uh, and. So anyhow, uh, that's, uh, and the media has missed the boat. And uh, there was a wonderful article about our media that is entitled, uh, uh, you can get the whole gist of it from the title, um, Balance as Bias. Uh, you know, reporting this uh, 
on the other hand, uh, you know, the two sides of every story, uh, when in, you know, there really isn't uh, another side on so many of the climate issues that are disputed uh, still. So what else? Let's, t uh, yes, please. There's a mic. Gus, I wonder if you have any thoughts on a question that has been um, troubling me, not troubling, but I've been wondering about. We know that um, American society has been a major player in some major social movements in the past, um, abolition of slavery, civil rights movement, women's suffrage movement. That one might be a little bit, you know, maybe sort of different in kind because it was much more focused. So I keep wondering, is there some common mechanism in those past movements that could be used as a guide for what it takes to go forward? And as an example, you know, it's one thing for different individuals, including you, to eloquently lay out a vision, but is that, is that what will gather people together, or do people have to actually be more actively participating in developing a shared vision before there's going to be the motivation well, to kind of get to a critical mass of a social yeah. movement? Or is there some other common thread? Like, what's, is there a key or is there not a key? Well, I, as I've said, uh, I think uh, a big part of this is, is, is getting the progressives out of their silos and into the same, under the same tent and working together because there's a tremendous strength there that's not being uh, realized. And, um, and I, I, I do think uh, that, um, you know, we need to engage in a lot more direct action. Uh, we saw what we thought might be the, the beginnings of a real movement with Occupy and I, I think that still they did, a, they did a fantastic job on a lot of things. And uh, they, we need to see that continued and, and, and reborn in different ways. Um, I was in Madison, Wisconsin recently and uh, saw the, uh, you know, the, the continuing reverberations from the big group that uh, 100,000 people had assembled around the Madison State House and were prepared to stay there day after day. And all the progressive different stripes of progressive uh, came together. It wasn't just pro-labor, it was uh, environmentalists were there. And, um, uh, and I think the, uh, you know, I don't, um, uh, the, the environmentalist in my tribe uh, has had a hard time getting, uh, getting mobilized, getting grassroots, getting into politics. They just have not done that worth a hoot. I haven't done it worth a hoot. I mean, I was there. Um, and um, I, I think that uh, that's uh, you know, extremely important. Look at what the Tea Party did. The Tea Party went from protest to movement to power within a few years. Now, it may be waning now, but that's their own fault. They didn't, you know, they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot, I think, at this point. But they, uh, but they developed a, a powerful uh, movement, and, uh, and I, I think we, you know, we can learn a lot from that. We do see some of this happening. I, I mean, give uh, Van Jones uh, tremendous credit for launching this Rebuild the Dream effort, and give Bill McKibben great credit for uh, really building up the uh, grassroots movement on, uh, on climate and climate justice. Uh, and, uh, you know, Move On is moving on to a, another phase of, it, of its work. So there's a, there's a lot going on, and there are groups that do, do bridge across these issues, like the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington and others. Uh, but, um, and, and I'm going down to Washington right before this march on the 17th to meet with a group of labor leaders who are trying to really build a coalition, uh, a broader coalition of labor and environment and other uh, groups like the National People's Action and the Domestic Workers Union and others will all be represented there. So there's a lot going on in, in the country and uh, you know I don't have a, I, I think it's, it, I have a chapter on, on movement building that talks about these different uh, elements that have to come together. But honestly I don't know myself exactly uh, the first step to take other than to say that I think that you know the progressives need to uh, read this wonderful article in the Stanford Social Innovation Review about what it really takes to, uh, uh, to, to, to do, you know, to affect real change uh, in a complex uh, society. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, among other things, it says they got to get together. And uh, they're not now. Uh, yeah, somebody. Uh, yes, John. Uh, Gus, uh, just over 52 years ago, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who normally wouldn't be what's in regard to this progressive, probably put forward uh, one of the most compelling rationales in, in his 
uh, or warnings in his uh, farewell address. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, a, just over a week ago, in the Senate Armed Services Committee, uh, when Chuck Hagel was testifying, there was some sort of subtext. It almost seemed like a heresy trial for being an Eisenhower Republican. In, a, in effect, the uh, you know the very fact that, that he, he wasn't going to be uh, he, he was potentially going to be in the position of Secretary of Defense, not not cheerleading for uh, you know the, you know the military industrial complex. I, I wonder whether uh, uh, part of the change that may be needed may be essentially the, not just on the progressive side, but possible fault lines among. You know, some of the libertarian conservatives and so forth, essentially breaking from, you know, this uh, kind of neocon uh, approach that you know really was you know, was seen very much from you know the members of the Armed Services Committee there, and I mean somehow uh, uh, you know that may be important to move it along as well as as the uh, you know some of the other organizations you're talking about if if we're going to have a chance of uh, accomplishing some of these things. Yeah. Well, I think you're right, and I think um, that, uh, did you see the uh, Nate Silver uh, column in the New York Times uh, about swing congressional districts? Uh, he, uh, they, you know, the statistical technique for determining whether a congressional district is a, is a swing district, and the number of them in the United States from some period not too long ago till today has gone down uh, in what, there are 400 and some odd seats in the Congress. Uh, the number's gone down from, from something like 150 uh, swing districts uh, to 30-something. Uh, so these are all safe seats. I mean, almost every seat in the House is safe for one party or, or the other. And, and so they compete to see who can appeal to the base in the strongest way. And then there are groups like the Club for Growth on the Republican side that come in and try to systematically uh, you know, remove uh, the, what they call rhinos, of course, right? Republicans in name only. Uh, and they have. They've virtually eliminated uh, the moderate Republicans that, that John was uh, referring to. Uh, and, that, um, and that this center uh, is uh, dedicated to. Uh, and uh, so it's, um, it, it really is a, a terrible uh, you know, set of results, um, and uh, you know, the, the, I don't know. I think rebuilding is going to require a real, a real push for independently determined congressional districts, uh, and um, you know, get redistricting done independently, uh, and uh, start over uh, through over time. Yeah. You started your talk um, by giving us some relative rankings of the United States in a variety of uh, categories. And then you compared it to one figure, the change in GDP since 1980. Um, would you have the relative ranking of that change with the countries that are above us? Um, because if they experienced the same rate of change, you might suspect that our indicators are going to stay about the same. So well, I think it might I, be I, important. I, I have seen data, uh, and I don't have it with me, but I have seen data that we, that our rank uh, in that group of 20 countries has fallen. Uh, we weren't always at the bottom. Uh, then almost uh, most of these indicators, uh, you know, we have gravitated uh, towards the bottom uh, of the ranking. Um, you know, they're, they're also not the top in income anymore. Yeah. Those well, that's true. Uh, I wanted to mention something that. Uh, How did the other countries' GDP do during that period? About the same. As, as us? Roughly the same, yeah. I'm told roughly the same as, uh, okay. as we okay. did. So the U.S. and in Europe are roughly the same if you look at things from a long term perspective. Um, I want to uh, shore up my bona fides here uh, by uh, at least reading from a, a footnote. Um, I, I'd report in the, in the footnote that, uh, in fact, we've done uh, well in, in some 
uh, key respects. Between 1960 and 2005, uh, life expectancy grew uh, from 70 to 78 years in this country. The proportion of the population with high school diplomas grew from 41 percent to 84 uh, percent. And the proportion of those with bachelor's degrees grew from 8 percent to 27 percent. So, you know, amid this, uh, these, all these emerging problems there, you know, there has been progress on, on some fronts if you look at the, what has happened within the country and, and not in terms of these international comparisons. Yeah, Eric. One of, the <clears throat> one of the people looming over this auditorium right now is Dana Meadows and her wonderful reliance on systems. And if you were to talk to the 20-year-olds in this auditorium today, and one of the things Dana always mentioned was the importance of where one intervenes, where the right. point of intervention is. If you were to look at the, the folks who are in their 20s and 30s who are going to really live in this world that's unfolding, could you name a few of the what you think would be the fundamental intervention points, the key places where they might make a particularly effective difference? Well, I think one of her key points was the importance of sort of changing the paradigm, uh, the basic uh, mental model uh, that we bring to all of these issues. And, 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 and that, in a way, is the thing I've tried to stress, is that uh, we need to think in terms of, uh, of systemic change and not just incremental reform and break that down into you know, bite-sized pieces. But I, I, if I were uh, a young person today, I think I would go in, in one of uh, two directions. Uh, one would be to, um, to, uh, to really uh, join forces with the organizations and the people that are trying to, uh, uh, to salvage and, and strengthen our democracy. Uh, I, think, I think we're in real trouble, uh, and, uh, and there are great groups out there to work with, including uh, right here in, in New, New Hampshire, uh, you know, Americans for Campaign Reform. Uh, is a really good group, but there, there are others uh, that are working as part of a coalition to try to uh, get to public and small donor financing, uh, get around the big money even despite the Supreme Court. There's just a host of things that, that we need to work on in, in that area. The other direction is to, is to really start trying to, uh, you know, uh, work at the community level. Uh, there's nothing stopping us from making the changes that we need to make, at least those that can be made locally. Uh, and and uh, we're seeing that in kind of two, two places uh, primarily, I would say, today. One is university towns, like this one, uh, and, um, you know, and, and I don't know much about what's happening in Hanover. Uh, I, I don't. I know more about what's happening in Montpelier and the great things there and in Burlington, but, you know, is, is, uh, uh, but anyhow, the community level action uh, it strikes me as a, uh, and, and creating new uh, enterprise forms. Um, check out uh, Mosaic, uh, Solar Mosaic. Uh, and uh, this is an uh, uh, organization that was, you know, uh, crowdfunding uh, solar energy projects. And it just took off, boom, started by a guy I used to teach, uh, Billy Parrish. Uh, Anyhow, there's a lot of new business models uh, and things happening uh, locally. This uh, Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, uh, Bali, is a great place to look for inspiration about things happening at the local level and the community level. Uh, the, the, the Democracy Collaborative at the University of Maryland uh, has a, you know, a, a, a whole a lot of writings on this subject now and, and the models of how to uh, to engage uh, in communities. One of the things that they have worked on is this Evergreen Cooperative in Cleveland, which is, you know, kind of, uh, which is a uh, inner city worker, uh, worker owned, inner city owned co-op uh, in Cleveland. Uh, and they are developing three lines of business. Um, uh, a big laundry aimed at what they call anchor institutions the places that can't move, the universities and the uh, uh, facilities, uh, hospitals and things. Um, and uh, secondly, um, uh, uh, solarization business. And thirdly, of all things, the lettuce 
growing operation, uh, which is going to be quite large. Uh, so, but anyhow, this is uh, kind of um, on the uh, Mondragon uh, model of, uh, of the Basque region, uh, these, and, and, you know, which is now one of the, well, it's a huge worker owned enterprise now, billions of dollars. Um, but um, anyhow, th I think those are the two directions to, to answer the question that I, if, uh, if I were young and uh, able, uh, able bodied, uh, I would try to, uh, to, to work on those areas. Uh, I would like to see the environmental community get dragged into some of these broader issues, uh, you know, we, we, and into electoral politics a lot more uh, than it has. And I see some signs of change, but not, not the big changes that, that we need in that area. Uh, so somebody needs to start a, you know, environmentalist for political reform movement. Yeah. I don't think you've mentioned Teddy Roosevelt today. I don't think you've mentioned Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, Teddy, well, actually, a lot of presidents I haven't mentioned, but Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt what, was making, what, uh, was making, what should I have done about Teddy? Well, just that, that he was making arguments that were very similar to the arguments that, that you're making now in the 1912 presidential campaign, right? Um, and, you know, and, I, and I wonder... We've had such about, great, uh, you know, Brandeis. You look at what Brandeis was, you know, wrote and said. I mean, it's amazing stuff, and yeah. But that was the that was where the progressive movement came from, and yeah. you've used progressive as a kind of a, a rallying call to bring together a bunch of fragmented parts. And I'm I'm wondering how you understand what it is to be a progressive, and to what extent is that a unifying theme or identity? Well, I don't think it is a very unifying identity now. Uh, and um, in the book, I, I identify a you know, communities that I think have progressive wings, so areas uh, uh, where progressives are, are working. And, um, you know, I, I don't uh, want to be, try to be clever. I, I think it, uh, it, for me, it's just uh, a, another word for liberal. But liberal is uh, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. sense of politically liberal. Um, but, you know, if you talk about presidents, let me, let me remind, the stuff that I write, you know, somebody says, oh, it's too radical. Uh, but, you know, here's what uh, Franklin Roosevelt said uh, in his uh, uh, Economic Bill of Rights uh, you know, that the people of the country should have, uh, and this was our president, uh, the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right uh, of, uh, of, every, uh, of every family to a decent home the right to adequate medical care and an opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from economic fears of old age and sickness and accident and unemployment. Guess what percentage of uh, lost wages U.S. unemployment programs cover when they are operating? Fourteen. Um, the right to a good education. And he goes on. Uh, so if we had, you know, in a way, stuck with Roosevelt, uh, continued to build on that legacy, uh, rather than moving so sharply away from it, uh, the kind of things that we've been talking about here today and that, you know, I, I write about and others write about better than me, uh, you know, wouldn't seem that uh, far-reaching at all. They would seem like the natural next steps. So it's only because we have slid so far politically away from, you know, where we were in, in that era. Um, so, yeah, uh, thank you. Yes? Um, related to campaign finance reform, but um, if we had publicly, publicly financed, voter-directed campaign funding, mm -hmm. what, um, how easy would the changes be that you've envisioned? How significant would that be a part Well, I think it depends on whether, you know, the progressives get together to take advantage. One of the legislatures in our country where a lot of the members are elected with public support is Arizona. And, you know, the, the conservatives move to take advantage of the public financing opportunity. So it's, a, you know, it's neutral politically uh, in that sense. Uh, and it all depends on sort of who takes advantage of it, but at least it's people power and not money power. 
uh, and at least it's not the corporations, you know, calling the shots uh, as much. Uh, so I think, um, you know, it would be a, a big step in the right direction, maybe a, a necessary uh, but not sufficient uh, opening uh, if we had that. Of course, we could also uh, change the composition of the Supreme Court and reverse these uh, decisions, uh, some of which, you know, uh, or we could have a constitutional amendment. There's a pretty good movement in the country uh, around this uh, move to amend uh, thought, uh, but, you know, it still seems like a, a long shot, uh, doesn't it? Um, any constitutional amendment, but it's happened before. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you, you touched on redistricting. Um, I'm wondering if you, I'm wondering if you have a thought about how uh, we can go about counteracting the uh, uh, problems with gerrymandering. Yeah, I think um, you know the the, the um, uh, this this is um, uh, you know we don't have to have congressional districts. I was surprised to learn this. Uh, it's not in the Constitution. We could have proportional representation in the U.S. Uh, and uh, have all the uh, members of Congress elected uh, statewide. Um, but uh, given now all that, I, I think you know you, they, there are uh, places where there have been independent, uh, politically uh, bipartisan, or even better, uh, nonpartisan uh, uh, independent committees uh, set up to do the districting uh, for uh, for, a for a state. And so it takes it out of this, uh, the gerrymandering is a result of efforts to, uh, you know, on both sides to in ensure a certain number of seats. What might really uh, drive real change in this area is if this idea uh, gets uh, any steam of having uh, the electoral votes cast according to how the congressional districts vote. You know, your number of electoral votes is your total number of House seats plus two for the Senate. Uh, in effect, and uh, there are proposals in a number of states to have congressional districts uh, have the vote of, of, the, of the elector uh, determined by how the congressional district goes, not the winner-take-all statewide model that we have now. Well, not all states have winner-take-all, but most do. Uh, and you know who would be president if we elected the, uh, the president that way? It wouldn't be Mr. Obama. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, but uh, I think if that boomlet ever took off, uh, uh, the, uh, the idea of a constitutional amendment for direct popular election of the president would gain tremendous uh, momentum in the country. So there, yeah, yes. Um, so just as a student organizer and working on a lot of different campaigns here at Dartmouth, um, what I found to be very difficult is engaging people who aren't necessarily in this room. Um, you know, we're talking about the mass media and how people are misinformed, but I find it's very hard to sometimes engage people who um, otherwise wouldn't be part of this movement. So what, um, I don't know, what do you suggest as a way to overcoming that or how to talk to those people? Oh, wow. Well, I think it depends on the people, uh, but congratulations on what you're doing. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's always a, a good question to ask people, you know, do you, do you really know where we are today, uh, uh, how serious these problems are, and, um, and what kind of country do you really want? Uh, you know, what's, what do you want the world to be like when, you know, people of your generation, uh, you know, uh, are getting to my age? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and older folks like me, you know, ask them what they, uh, uh, what they, what, what's the world they want for their grandchildren and their children? Uh, that's very powerful, and and uh, you know I think most people believe that we need to make deep change. They are just uh, 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 uncertain about how to uh, uh, how to uh, you know that it's possible that we'll end up with something better. And I, what I try to do in the book is to sh you know say that we, we not only. Uh, can make deep change, but if we, you know, pursue the right avenues, we'll we'll uh, end up with a world that's dramatically better for the new generations. Um, I. Uh, what else? Uh, there was another hand or two. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, am I on here? Um, 
I guess I'm, I'm a farmer. I'm not in this academic group here, so I feel a little out of place. Um, I'm, I've always been a progressive, and I like listening to the possibility of a proactive future. But however, as a farmer, I don't think we have near that long a timeline. And so what changes we have may be reactive rather than proactive. And, and I'm talking about mass food shortages in the very near future. Um, you know, two, three, five years out, and you know what what you think along those lines. Uh, but also to address what she said here, this is a fundamental a change as losing your faith, because we have a faith here in this world of our infinite growth, so on like that, and that's that's as much as a religious change. And so when you address people, it's very difficult to get to the other side of that line. I think the most fearsome challenge uh, in the world today is a combination uh, of uh, what you might call the food, water, energy, climate nexus, and the way those things could come together uh, for uh, the world's most desperate people already. I mean, that uh, to me is, uh, it, it looks, you know, and I looked at it in the book and the other context, it looks so, so serious uh, for, you know, a couple of billion people. And um, so uh, I, um, I, I, I think you're, I don't know what, were you thinking about uh, food shortages in the, among the, among the rich, uh, us folks? Uh, I'm not talking about Africa. Really? About here. Yeah. Well, I can see uh, I can see climate change uh, affecting agriculture in a big way. It already has, hasn't it? Uh, uh, corn prices and other things. Um, all right, what else? Uh, yes. <laughs> what I well, I want to read you a little poem I found about uh, future generations, and then uh, it's uh, it's by a uh, uh, son of a. Uh, we'll get there a son of a friend of mine. Um, it's kind of a rap thing. Uh, it's 3.23 in the morning and I'm wide awake. Because of my great-great-grandchildren, they won't let me sleep. My great-great-grandchildren asked me in dreams, what did you do when the planet was plundered? What did you do when the earth was unraveling? And that'll get you motivated. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you could speak for a second about uh, divestment and the campaign is kind of... Is Dartmouth, uh, the students at Dartmouth, pushing for divestment of fossil fuel investments in the endowment? I hope so. Um, I hope so. I, I, uh, I, I, I heard from McKibben the other day that something like 250 colleges and universities in the U.S. have student movements to do that or underway. Only a few have succeeded. Um, two in Vermont and one in Maine. Uh, and, uh, but the, um, uh, you know, it's important to, to, to do that. I think it's, a, it's an ethical matter and the universities need to provide ethical leadership. Is that what you were thinking about? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. More or less. <laughs> You've, uh, talk passionately about the need for fundamental transformative systemic change. And going back in human history, there have been transformative changes in the past in human societies. But yeah. do you see the current challenges at this point in the history of the species and the planet that there are unique new challenges that have not really been faced in the same way before? And if so, do you could you identify what is special about those challenges and in what ways we might be optimistic about our capacity to bring about this That's a big, big question. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I'm the best person to answer it. I'll tell you who might be the best person to answer it. To, uh, and what was his name? Uh, the person who wrote uh, Why the West is Ahead, slash, dash, for now, uh, because uh, he uh, d does have a profound uh, sense of history and, uh, and basically, uh, you know, uh, concluded that, uh, that, that we're faced with a, 
a collection of problems simultaneously, what uh, he calls four horsemen uh, that have ridden through history but rarely come together at one time like they have now. And uh, uh, so I, certainly the, um, at least in its scale and in its, uh, you know, uh, appearance in, in, the, in uh, the context of uh, large civilizations, the climate issue, I would say, is, is not really matched at any point in history, although people, you know, will say that a particular civilization uh, might, you know, was affected by climate earlier. But I think this is different. Uh, and the only good news is that unlike the era in the late, in 19, say, 2006 and seven, when the climate issue started really coming to the fore and Gore got his Academy Award and everything and it looked like real action was inevitable. The difference now is that people are motivated not by sort of uh, uh, you know, uh, dramatizations, but they're motivated by real effects. Uh, you know, Sandy and uh, the droughts and uh, the temperature records uh, all over the country and the warmest uh, summer in history, I think. Uh, so um, I, I think um, I, I, I think that we'll be driven to act on climate by the effects that are being experienced. But what is, you, you asked that question in a very intelligent way. What do you think the answer is? Uh, you sound like a, a person who might have an answer to his own question. If I had the answer, I wouldn't have asked it. <laughs> Dealing with coming together on a global scale to deal with a common problem is a, is a new is a new challenge. Right? Yeah. Well, uh, um, some people would argue that as a as a species we don't have the uh, the evolution of our minds and our cultural capacities to be able to deal with that. But I guess I'm an optimist about our capacity to come to terms with that. Well, here's what uh, Ian. Morris uh, said in Why the West Rules, that was actually the name, for now. As when the horsemen rode in the past, climate change, famine, migration, and disease will probably feed back on one another, unleashing the fifth horseman state failure. Every year we avoid Armageddon. The threats from the horsemen of the apocalypse keep building. Pressure on resources will mount, new diseases will evolve, nuclear weapons will proliferate, and most insidious of all, global weirding will shift the calculus in unpredictable ways. It seems crazily optimistic to think we can juggle all these dangers indefinitely. The odds look bad. Uh, and he, this, is, this is a more thoughtful, serious man than I am. Uh, and that's what he had to say. So we, we are, we're in a hell of a problem, uh, um, in a nutshell. Thank you very much.